But uh, I'm excited to share the word with you. Are you ready to hear it? Okay, awesome. I'm going to jump straight into it. Uh, go with me to 1 Samuel today, 1 Samuel chapter number 17. And I'm going to look at verses 41 through 47. 1 Samuel 17. We'll start at verse number 41, and we'll land at verse number 47. DFL was amazing. Come on. What? You know, there's some stuff you don't got to pray about. You ain't got to pray about registering for next year. It's going to be awesome. You, you should register. It's going to be incredible. Before I jump in the Word, how many of you have never heard me preach before? Can I see your hand if you've never heard me preach? Oh, quite a few of you. A quick disclaimer. Uh, I am a hollaback preacher, Okay. Uh, all that means is while I'm preaching today, if you are feeling anything I'm saying, if it's resonating with you, you can say amen. You can say preach that. You can say, mm, that was good. Even if it's not good, just shout it's good. You'll make me think it's good and it'll get better, okay? <laughs> so just be verbally involved today. We're going to look at a very familiar passage of Scripture, so familiar, we're jumping in the middle of the story. At verse number 41, it says, meanwhile, meanwhile, Woo. and it was a meanwhile. Because for 40 days, a giant has been taunting the children of Israel. It's interesting because he hasn't even hit them, but just the threat of what he was going to do caused them all to be paralyzed by fear. Sometimes it's just the threat of what the enemy is going to do that can cause you to be paralyzed by fear. Meanwhile, the Philistine with his shield bearer in front of him kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. That made me laugh. <laughs> he despised him, but he had to admit, you are healthy and handsome. Come on, you know you're handsome when even your haters are like, you look good. <laughs> and he said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. And David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day, I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know there is a God in Israel." And all those gathered here will know that that is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. Can you say amen? That's good all by itself. Those are some fighting words right there. I want to tag a title to this text and just preach from this thought, not long, probably about two and a half hours. Uh, just using this as a title, who you talking to? Who you, not who are you talking to? <laughs> who you talking to? Come on, let's have some fun. Help me preach. Look at your neighbor, whichever one you like the best. And just look at them right in the face and say, neighbor, I want to know who you talking to? Come on, if you believe God's going to speak, would you give him some praise up in here? Whew. Father, have your way today. Lord, we open up our hearts and our minds to receive the power of your word. God, we know the grass withers, the flower fades, but your word will stand forever. Speak to us today and let us leave different than the way that we came in. In Jesus' name, everybody said, yeah. everybody said, yeah. amen. I'll tell you what, James River family, I love the way that God orchestrates things. Um, before I really jump into the message today, I'm actually going to invite somebody uh, to come out and just share a little bit. And I had no clue this person would be here, but when I saw they were here, I was like, they've got to say something. And the reason I want them to share is because uh, I believe that this person um, is without a doubt one of the most powerful and influential communicators of our lifetime. And since they're here, I think they should share. And as soon as they come out, you're going to know exactly who they are. But even before they come out, would you do me a favor? Would you just welcome them to the stage as they come out? Come on. Would you welcome them? Come on. Come on, y'all can do better than that. Welcome to their coming. Come on. Do you see you? 
we pause for online. <laughs> oh, oh, over here. Y'all got to see you. See you. Okay, you can be seated. <laughs> oh, the disappointment that was on some of y'all's faces. You like, I thought somebody was really coming out. I thought Taylor Swift was coming. No, just you. <laughs> and please don't let the disappointment or even the comedy downplay or make you forget what I said in my fake introduction. I said, I want to bring out to the stage one of the most powerful and influential communicators of our lifetime. Then I brought out a mirror and asked you, can you see you? And my question for you today is, who talks to you more than you? Who influences what you do more than you? You are a powerful communicator. You are an influential communicator. James River, who decides where you will go or not go? What you will say or not say? What you're going to eat or not eat? What you will post or not post more than you? You are a powerful and influential communicator. You are, hear me, not the greatest communicator that you've ever heard. You are the greatest communicator that you are always hearing. You are always in your head talking to you about you. And I want to know today who you talking to. What is the conversation that is going on in your head? Because that conversation is critical. As a matter of fact, even as I stand here today preaching the infallible, incorruptible Word of God, and I do everything that I can to preach it with clarity, however, I'm fully aware of the fact that the most powerful voice is not just what I'm saying to you, it's what you're saying to you about what I'm saying to you. That's the voice that matters. Because I could be saying, whoo, God is going to open doors for you. And you could be saying, well, not for me. Not in this stage, this age of my life. There's no door he's about to open. I could say, this is going to be your year for a radical breakthrough. And you could be saying, well, if God was going to do a breakthrough, he should have done it in January. We're all the way here in October. What are you saying to you about what I'm saying to you? I could be saying that God can use even your suffering your most painful moments to shape you into the image of God, and your pain can actually be a platform for God's purposes in your life. But you could be saying to you, why am I even going through this pain? And God, I think it's your fault. Who are you talking to? Because that internal voice is critical. It is the story that you are telling yourself that will ultimately navigate the direction of your life. Have you ever noticed when you're watching the news, they call the person that's giving the news the anchor? You know why they call them the anchor? Because they're trying to get a story to sink down into your heart. And whatever story you tell yourself the most is the story that will navigate your life. Who are you talking to? Some of you, who, if somebody else talked to you the way you talk to yourself, you would slap them in the face. And I want to know, what are you saying to you? Are you repeating what your heavenly Father has declared over you? Some of you are just saying the things that somebody else spoke over your life. Some of you, even at a young age, and those words have now grown in your mind, and every time you rehearse it, it's like watering the seed of the word they planted, and you have forgotten who God says you are because what you are saying about you is contradictory to what God has said about you. Who? Are you talking to? I'm beginning to find out in life that life is not so much about the external confrontations. It's more about the internal conversations that you are having with yourself. Who are you talking to? Which brings me to my text today, 1 Samuel chapter 17. I shouldn't even read it because, come on, you know it. Matter of fact, I saw some of your faces when I started reading it. You're like, really, David and Goliath? This is what I got out of the bed for? Because let's be honest, it's one of those passages that if you've been raised in church, you know the story of David and Goliath. Look, y'all, I've been raised in church, went to Hallelujah Night, went to Vacation Bible School, Royal Rangers, proud Sunday school alumnus. I'm telling you, I have been raised in church, and I've heard people jack up some Bible stories. I've never heard anybody jack up David and Goliath. Everybody knows David and Goliath, and I've heard people mess up some Bible stories. Even recently, a guy came up to me, he's like, hey, pastor, it's messed up how they did Joseph in the Bible. I said, yeah. He's like, yeah. It's just messed up how his brothers threw him in the pit. I said, yeah, that was messed up. He said, but he came back, though. I said, yeah. He said, he came back? He came back because he married Mary, and then they gave birth to Jesus? He's like, I'm telling you. <laughs> I'm thinking, bro, that's the wrong Joseph. 
but I've, I've heard some people mess up some Bible stories, but I've never heard anybody mess up David and Goliath. This is the most iconic story in the Bible. They use it in the sports world whenever there's an underdog. Everybody knows David and Goliath, and maybe that's the problem, because I think it is our familiarity with this text that has actually robbed us of the revelation that is within this passage. And so as I was reading it again, I was asking the Holy Spirit, open up my eyes again to see what is in this text that I missed. And turns out, I missed a whole bunch. I didn't realize that this entire story has little to do with the fight in the valley. Come on, y'all. The fight is not what this story is about. Come on, you know, the fight is the shortest part of the narrative. It is the shortest part. Read it again when you get to the crib. 58 verses, the fight is the shortest part. We can really dissect this fight and put it in four stanzas. David hit him with a rock. He fell down dead. He cut off his head. Hooray. That's the whole fight right there? <laughs> That's how quick the fight is. Why then are there 58 verses in 1 Samuel chapter 17? I'll tell you what it is. It's all that talking. It's all these conversations that are happening within the text. As a matter of fact, when we meet Goliath, what is he doing? He's talking. He's threatening. He's letting them know, I defy your gods. And it was not his sword or his punches that had them paralyzed in fear. It was all the things that he was saying. And I love David because you know what gave David confidence? It was who he was talking to. See, when he was out there watching those stinky sheep, he was out there singing songs to his God, and he was talking to God, and God was talking to him. And whenever you talk to God, you find out who you are, and you know whose you are. And that's why David had the confidence to go defeat that giant because of who he was talking to. Ooh, I can tell who you're talking to by the way you hold up your head, by the confidence that you have. And it's not arrogance. It's confidence in a God who's gone before you, a God who says, if I'm for you, who can be against you? And this starts with who you're talking to. So I want us to look at this text with fresh eyes, and I really want us to look at this text in five conversations. There are five conversations that David had before he got in the fight that I believe were critical to his destiny and to yours. And there are principles from these five conversations that I want us to look at, and then we're going to go to brunch and have an amazing day. Is that cool? The first conversation is the conversation that he has with his father, Jesse. I call this the Uber Eats conversation. It's the Uber Eats conversation because... His father, Jesse, calls him in and says, hey, I need you to go take bread and cheeses to your brothers who are on the battlefield. That is the conversation. It doesn't seem like it's a big deal, but it is a big deal. It's a small task, but it is a major task. I have learned that sometimes big things are disguised as small things. Even in our church right now, I look for how people do small things. If you can take a small thing serious, it lets me know I can trust you to do something that seems like it's bigger. I like to see, can you hold a sign in the parking lot? Can you clean up when we're walking into these venues that had all kinds of aroma before we got in? I know you want to get the stage and sing a solo, but can you serve first? How you do a small thing is how you do everything. Thing. And it didn't seem like it was a big deal for David to just go deliver cheese and bread to his brothers, but it was a very big deal. Understand, if he doesn't make this Uber Eats delivery, he never gets positioned for his destiny to fight the giant. But what makes it even bigger is what preceded the moment. See, he gets the conversation with his dad to go deliver the cheese and bread in 1 Samuel 17. But in 1 Samuel chapter 16, don't forget what happened. Samuel the prophet is anointing the next king of Israel. Saul has been rejected, and he goes to Jesse's house, and he says, show me your sons. He puts all of his sons, seven boys in front of them. All of them get rejected, and then Samuel has to ask Jesse a question. You shouldn't have to ask a father. He goes, do you have any other kids? <laughs> he's like, oh yeah, I do have another one, uh, David, but he's out there with the sheep, and Samuel says, call for him, and then does the most gangster move. He goes, and we will not sit down until he comes. He makes those brothers stand in their rejection for who knows how long. How long did it take David to get from the field to the room? And there they are just standing in rejection, waiting for David, the one that was alienated, waiting for him to come in. And as soon as he comes in the room, smelling like sheep, Saul goes, Samuel goes, you're the one. 
this is who's next. And he anoints him as king in front of his brothers. It was a destiny moment. He was hand-selected, picked by God. And right after he gets hand-selected, it's not like he went to the palace. He had to go right back into the stinky field with the sheep. And then his father says, hey, can you come here? I need you to do something for me. You had to think. If I'm David, I'm thinking, okay, maybe he's going to apologize for not inviting me when the prophet came into town. Yeah, he's going to say, I'm so sorry that I didn't deem you worthy to be one of the next kings. I bet he's going to tell me, I'm so sorry. I, I, that's me. I'm even preparing myself for that conversation. And then he says, hey, can you go take your brothers some cheese and bread? If that was me, I would have been like, who are you talking to? You want me? I, don't you know I'm next? I'm about to be king. You want me to deliver charcuterie and I'm about to be the next king? Who are you talking to? That would have been me. Oh, but not David. What does David say? I'll do it. David pulls a Chick-fil-A and says, my pleasure. <laughs> Whatever my father asks of me, I'm going to do it. Whatever my father wants from me, I'm going to do it. I know I just got anointed king, but I'm still okay to serve. I don't think this is beneath me. What is David showing us? He's showing us that you've got to have a heart of humility to be positioned for your destiny. You've got to have a heart that says, whatever my father wants of me, I will do it. Whatever my father wants me to go, I will go. Whatever my father wants me to say, I will say it. Do you know what destroys so many people and they never step into the fullness of their purpose? It's pride. 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 Some of you, if that would have been you, you would have said, do you know who you are talking to? I'm the next king of Israel. David had a heart of humility that said, whatever my father wants me to do, I will do. Hear me. Pride will close doors that God is trying to open for you. Pride will destroy your family. Pride will destroy your destiny. St. Augustine says that pride is the sin beneath every single sin. The arrogance that makes us think we are above things. David had a heart of humility that said, whatever my father wants me to do, I'll do. Could it be possible that pride is destroying your purpose and the thing that God wants to do in you and through you? But David says, I've got a heart of humility. So even though I'm the next king, let me go do this Uber Eats delivery. And he takes the bread and he takes the cheeses. And watch this. I love the timing of God. Right at the moment he goes to deliver the cheese and the bread, it just so happens Goliath comes out at the exact time, and Goliath starts saying what he's been saying for the last 40 days. And when David heard it, he said, hold up, hold up. Let me finish sending this delivered to Jesse. Hold on. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? That's Christian custard. That dare defies the armies of the living God. David had a completely different reaction to what Goliath had been been saying for several days. Isn't it intriguing how people can hear the same thing but have two totally different reactions? The children of Israel heard Goliath saying what he said, and they were paralyzed in fear because of the opposition. David hears the same thing. He starts moving to action and says, this is an opportunity for God to show how great he is. I'm telling you, faith hears things on a different frequency. Faith hears things at a level that people who walk by sight will never understand. People who only walk by sight will never understand people who are tuned into the frequency of faith. You'll never understand how they move, why they do what they do, because they are not just looking at what they see. They are hearing something from God, and that gives them the power and the fortitude to move the way they move. David heard the same thing, but had a completely different reaction. It reminds me of a company that was hiring people for a job, and they called all these applicants in. And all of a sudden, about 300 plus people showed up, and it was a long line of people waiting to go in to be interviewed for this job. As they're waiting in line, all of a sudden, a guy in the back gets out of the long line, skips everybody, and goes straight to the front door and walks in for the interview. And everybody that was standing in line is looking at him the same way you would have looked at him and like, wait a minute, you can't do that. You can't just cut. And he goes straight in. Well, it comes to find out they were applying, the job was to see who could interpret Morse code. So on a speaker, while they were all in line, was Morse code going out. And it was saying, if you can interpret this message, get out of the line 
and come straight to the front door. So the guy that heard on a different frequency than anybody else moved out of the line and went straight to the front and left everybody standing there. Can I tell you, when you are tuned in to the frequency of faith, you will step into the purpose that God has for you, and people will understand why you're moving the way you're moving, and you got to tell them, I'm not walking by sight, I'm walking by faith, and faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, and since I got a Word from God, I've got to move differently because of what He's speaking to me. I know it looks crazy, I know it looks ridiculous, but you don't hear what I hear. I wish I had somebody that had a frequency of faith that would just give God a little praise break right there. God is speaking some things to me. So when I move, know that I'm moving by what I hear. Ooh, people can hear the same thing and have totally different reactions. Two people can hear they're not hiring. One person will hear, I'll never get a job. My life is over. Somebody else will hear, Woo, that means that's not for me. God must have a better job for me. People can hear the same thing have different reactions. Two people can hear, I don't want to go on a date with you. <laughs> no. One person will hear, man, I have no value. I'm nobody. Somebody else will hear, thank God, I didn't have to waste my time at Chick-fil-A or Chipotle or Cheesecake Factory. God must have somebody better for me. Thank God we didn't have to go on a date and order appetizers for me to realize you're not the one. <laughs> what, what are you hearing? David heard something different when the giant came out. And then he goes to his next conversation. He looks at the soldiers, and look at what he says. I love it. He goes, what will be given to the man who defeats him? You missed it. <laughs> David, immediately after Goliath talks, goes, what will be given to the man who defeats him? Y'all missed it too. I just tried. Ah, David, here's Goliath talking. And the first thing he says what will be given to the man who defeats him? I love church people. They'll just give you a clap so you hurry up and move on to the next one. His mind is already focused on the victory. He says, what will be given to the man that defeats him? Because I already know I'm going to defeat him. David is showing, I don't just have a heart of humility. I got a vision of victory. I already see myself defeating this giant. So I want to know, what do you get when you defeat him? Oh, God wants to give you a vision of victory. Whoo! So many times our disappointment and our failure has clouded our vision to the point that you don't want to hope again. You don't want to believe again. You don't even see yourself getting the victory. But I'm telling you to take a note from King David. He already saw himself defeating the giant to the point he goes, what's the reward? <laughs> what do you get? And they're like, well, you're going to get the king's daughter in marriage and you'll never pay taxes again. He's like, oh, where is my slingshot? No taxes? He already sees himself Winning, you need a vision of victory. If I was the enemy, I would rob you of your hope through your past disappointments to the point you don't even see the victory. You don't even see the wall coming down. You don't even see the marriage being restored. You don't even see your child coming back. You don't even see yourself walking in abundance and actually being able to be a conduit of God's blessing. You don't even see it, but I'm believing God's going to open up your eyes and infuse you with faith and hope again so you'll get a vision. Victory. Come on, it's in the tough times that you got to hold on to the vision of victory. Oh, I'm in it right now, y'all. It, it is crazy in the Madhu household right now. We are in the middle of a church that is growing, and we feel like we're building the plane while we're flying it. We're homeschooling our kids this year. I'm in a master's program this year, and it is hard. But do you know what's keeping me? Is I got a vision of victory. You know what keeps us from venue to venue? Is I see us having our own worship space, giving God glory and praise. I see myself in 2026 walking across that stage with that little Batman hood on, my cat capping cap. You got to see it. You got to see. I see myself being faithful in ministry and still coming to James River. I'm talking, I'll be 80 some years old. I'm still going to be right here. I probably won't be preaching, but I'm just going to be in Branson, you know, doing a little vacation. I'm going to be right here on the front row. Stronghold of walls are like, just like this at 80 something. I see it. <laughs> Y'all going to be looking at me like, who is that crazy chocolate brother on the front row? They'll be like, don't worry about it. He used to come to James River back in the day. <laughs> Do you see 
yourself winning? David said, I, I, I see it. And then from there, he moves to the next conversation, a conversation that he didn't pick, but just came to him. His older brother, Eliab, runs to him. And it's interesting because the Bible says he had rage, full of anger, and he runs up to David. He's like, what are you doing here? He's like, what are you doing here? I know the conceit that is in your heart. You just come down here to see the battle. He said, and with whom have you left those little sheep? Eliab is burning with anger. You got to ask yourself, Eliab, what are you mad about? Well, I love the Bible because the Bible gives you blues clues <laughs> as to why he is so mad. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, don't forget who Eliab is. He is the oldest brother. He is the one that when Samuel came to anoint the next king, he goes straight to Eliab. That was his first pick because Eliab looked the part. He looked like he was the king, but God rejected him. Ooh, never underestimate what somebody will do who has been rejected and who has hurt and who is jealous of the position and the place that God has put you in. He is burning with rage. Eliab is the reason this verse is in your Bible. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And so Eliab, because of his rage, his envy, and his jealousy, he comes up to David and he says, what are you doing here? I know the conceit that is in your heart. You just came here to watch the battle. Y'all, if that was me, I would have been like, who are you talking to? What do you mean, what am I doing here? I'm coming here, first of all, to bring you cheese and bread and to defeat the giant that you two scared to defeat. What do you mean I came to watch the battle? Ain't no, ain't no battle going on. You ain't fighting nobody. <laughs> That's what I would have said. Y'all pray for me. <laughs> but David just goes, what have I done now? Which means this isn't the first time Eliab has gone off on him. He goes, what did I do now? Can I just talk? And then he does to me one of the most powerful moves in the text. Don't miss it. He turns from Eliab to talk to somebody else. He turns from Eliab to talk to somebody else. One more time for the online audience. He turns from Eliab to talk to somebody else because he knew, Eliab, you are not my real enemy. If you are going to win the war, you've got to have a heart of humility. You've got to have a vision of victory, but you also got to know your real enemy. And David knew, my brother is not my real enemy. I cannot waste my energy fighting my brother when there's a real enemy that's standing behind him. And I don't know who this is for today, but you've been wasting energy trying to throw rocks at your brother and your sister in Christ, and they are not your real enemy. How many you know, we got a bigger devil to fight, and I cannot fight my brother and sister in Christ when a giant has got to be knocked down behind him. Oh, God, would you wake up the church today to know who the real enemy is, that we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with principalities? God, would you bring unity to the church that we'll stop fighting our brother and sister and pull out our slingshot on the real devil that's trying to destroy us? Come on, somebody. A house divided cannot stand. That's why the enemy wants you fighting your brother. The enemy would love for you to pull out your slingshot on your older brother so he can stand and keep on laughing. And can I just beg of you, stop pulling out your slingshot on your brother. They are not your real enemy. I know they said something that makes you want to go off on them, <laughs> but they're not your enemy. And I'm so sick of seeing believers pull out their slingshot on their brother and sister in Christ in comment sections. <laughs> and all the while, the enemy's laughing. Go and look at them fighting against each other. I don't even got to fight. <laughs> They're going to destroy themselves because the enemy is not afraid of a big church. He's afraid of a united church that knows the real enemy. Your brother's not your enemy. Your sister's not your enemy. That's what I'm trying to tell my three little humans in the house. <laughs> we have three kids, 10, 9, and 7. The other day I came home, and my oldest daughter, Evie, had a beautiful sign on her door. She's an artist, and she painted it beautifully, and it literally said, no sibling zone. <laughs> and it made me laugh because I can't remember the last bill that she paid. 
She's never made any type of financial contribution. Isn't it funny how it's the father's house, but the child wants to decide which brother and which sister can come in a room, and it's not your house. It's the father's house, and can I tell you, this is the father's house. You don't get to pick who you think. Oh, <laughs> who should come in? Your brother, your sister is not your enemy. So he turns from Eliab and goes to the next conversation with Saul. He walks in, and Saul's answer to the problem has come in the room. You would think Saul would be the most excited. Finally, somebody will fight him. But Saul discourages him too. Saul goes, David, you can't fight that giant. He said he's been fighting since he was a youth. You're just a youth. You can't fight him. It's amazing to me how people who are afraid will project their own fears onto you because they never did it. And because they don't have the faith to believe for it, they will tell you why you can't do it. He says, you can't do this, David. You can't fight him. He starts giving David a history of the enemy. He said, he's been fighting since he's a youth. You can't do it. Sometimes the enemy will give you a history of who he's destroyed. Sometimes other people will do it. Everybody in your family has been an alcoholic. How do you think you're going to overcome it? It's been destroying people in your family for years. You have never had a marriage in your family make it. How in the world do you think yours is going to survive? The enemy loves to give you the history of all the people that have been destroyed. This is what Saul does, but I love what David does. David refuses to focus on the history of the enemy and how many people Goliath has killed. He chooses rather to focus on his history with God. Whew, who am I preaching to? Some of you have forgotten the past victories that God has brought you through, and if he brought you through that, he'll bring you through this. If he healed you before, he can heal you again. If he made a way before, he can make a way again. Your God is faithful. He doesn't have to do it the same way he did it, but he will come through because he is faithful. So look at David after getting the history of Goliath. He says, well, let me tell you my history. He said, I was out there in the field. And I killed a bear, and I killed a lion. And Saul's like, for real? David's like, yeah. I didn't post it. <laughs> but it happened. <laughs> He's like, wow. He starts telling Saul his history with God. And David concludes that if God protected me from the bear and the lion, I think the same God can help me knock down this giant who's big enough to eat hay and dumb enough to enjoy it. <laughs> and so Saul goes, all right. You want to fight him? I guess I can't stop you. He says, God be with you. <laughs> but before he leaves, watch what he does. He says, oh, but, but, but come here, David. Hold on. And Saul takes his armor and puts it on David. Come on, y'all. Do what I do when I preach. Put yourself in the text. Can you imagine being alienated and outcast by your family? Your father didn't even deem you worthy enough to be picked as the next king. And now destiny has put you in the presence of a king, and you're going to go fight a giant, and the king puts his armor on you? What an honor. I wonder if he looked in the mirror and said, wow, I've never worn armor before, and especially not armor this nice. Y'all, this is the equivalent of LeBron James calling in the locker room and saying, put my jersey on. And he looks at it, and perhaps he had a moment where he thought in his own mind, yeah, I killed the lion and the bear, but this is a bigger giant, and maybe a bigger giant requires me to be something I'm not. Maybe I should put it on, but he doesn't do it. He respectfully says, I can't go in these because this is not me. And when I was praying for you today, I was thinking of some of you who have been wearing other people's armor for years, trying to be your sister, trying to be your brother, trying to be the person that had the position before you got the position in the job. And you've been trying to fight a giant in somebody else's armor, and you're wondering why it's failing, because God did not grace or anoint you to be somebody else. He called you to be you. you got to take that armor off. Here it is, and work 
your weapon. Work your weapon. This is what David knew. He said, I cannot defeat my giant in somebody else's armor. I got to be who God created and called me to be. And I wish that God would break the chains of comparison off of somebody today that you would take off that armor and grab your slingshot and be happy to be who God uniquely called and graced you to be. That's the only way you're going to defeat your giant. It's not going to be trying to be somebody else. There's an anointing on the authenticity of who you are. Ooh, I feel like preaching. Can I just testify? I'm a horrible Pastor John Lindell. I'm a horrible Pastor Brandon. I'm horrible at being a Pastor David. I can't be a Pastor Debbie. I'm not a good Joyce Meyer. Can I tell you? I'm the best Robert Madu you have ever seen in your life. I gotta defeat my giant with the weapons God has given me. Oh, you better work your weapon. Be who God created you to be. Stop comparing yourself to other people. David says, I got to work. In fact, let me just show it to you in the text. Watch this. You can't even grab your weapon until you take off Saul's. Look at So he took them off. What did he take off? Saul's armor. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. He could not pick up his weapon until he took off Saul's. You cannot be who God called you to be until you take off everything that is not who God called you to be and work your weapon. But here's my question. Is the weapon enough? Is the slingshot enough for a giant who is nine foot nine? Is it enough? You know the story. Spoiler alert. He throws him the rock, hits him in the head, he falls down dead. But there are actually people who look at Scripture through the lens of science and they use it to refute the veracity of texts like this. And there are some scientists who believe that it is improbable and impossible and not even plausible that David could have ever defeated a giant with just a rock. And they did a whole report on it, and I brought the report that they wrote. They said it's just, it's just highly unlikely and not even plausible. And this is the report. They said that David with the rock the size of a baseball and with a slingshot, the fastest he could have released it would have been with a trajectory of about 90 miles per hour. And if you take a projectile going 90 miles per hour and you use Newton's second law of motion and you take into effect the coefficient of restitution, that a projectile of that size at 90 miles per hour would generate about 3,000 pounds of force as it was released. That is, if it was traveling the distance of a pitcher to the home plate, which is 60 feet and 6 inches. But since Goliath is at least twice that far, one also has to take into effect the drag of the distance of the ball that's working against the velocity of the force. Therefore, since he's further away, what was generated at 3,000 pounds has now reduced itself arguably to at least 1,000 pounds. That is, if David was throwing it straight. The problem is Goliath is taller than David, which means the angle of the projectile from which he launched it had to be at least 45 degrees, which means that now the ball is also working against the law of gravity, which also has reduced the force that the rock has been released. So what was 3,000 pounds of force has now been arguably reduced to about 500 pounds of force. But you must remember that there's an armor bearer who stands in front of Goliath who would have lifted up his shield to take the projectile off course, which would have reduced the force to at least 50 pounds and taken it off course of the direction headed towards Goliath's head. But if David could throw it, and if it did work against the drag, and if it did counter the weight, and if it did go against the coefficient of restitution, if it was knocked off course and still aimed at Goliath's head, Goliath is wearing a helmet. And a projectile that started with 3,000 pounds of force and ended at 50 hitting a bronze helmet would not have been enough to kill Goliath. So how can a young boy with one rock working against gravity, working against Newton's law of motion, working against the coefficient of restitution, working against the drag, being deflected by an armor bearer, hit a bronze helmet, how could that kill a giant? Scientists, I got all the questions that you got. I don't know how, but I do know one thing. He didn't just throw a rock at Goliath. He threw something else. He threw a name because he said, you come at me with sword and spear and javelin. But he didn't say, I come at you with slingshot. He said, I come at you in the name of the Lord God Almighty. In other words, I'm not just working my weapon. I'm not just throwing a rock. I'm throwing a name. That's the last thing I got to give you. You better throw the name that is above every name. You better throw the name that demons tremble at that name. You better throw the name that is lifted high. 
the only name that can save, set free, and deliver. His name is Jesus. Somebody take like 20 seconds and give Jesus the greatest shout of praise that you got. I'm throwing a name. I'm throwing a name. I know the giant's bigger. I know the cancer looks great. I got to throw the name that's above every name. David did not just throw a rock. He threw a name. We've read it so much, we read, we read too fast. <laughs> he said, you come at me with sword and spear and javelin. It makes sense to say, I come at you with slingshot. He didn't say that. He said, I come at you in the name of the Lord Almighty. I got a slingshot and a rock, but I'm aware this rock ain't enough. <laughs> I need the name to make sure the velocity of this rock hits the giant in the head and he falls down dead. Throw the name that is above every name. I know that giant looks big, but throw the name. Thank you so much for joining James River Church on our YouTube channel. Our prayer is that God encouraged you and your faith was strengthened today. And we would love for you to be a part of our online family. As well, we would love if you'd subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell for notifications. You'll be so glad you did because we're always putting out great sermons, new worship content, and it helps you know when we go live for our weekly services. We hope you have an amazing day. And thank you again for watching. God bless.